drafted papers at the 48 IEEE conference in decision in 2009, and another best paper award in the uh, conference on intelligence sensing and information processing in 2005. And also he has a NASA Group Achievement Award in 2003, a lot of awards. Okay. Um, so I met uh, uh, Prabir actually in Paris uh, while I was visiting uh, one of the research labs in Linux, and uh, he was giving a very excellent talk and uh, very interested in his uh, research in, in energy control distribution. So I guess that's a lot of actually going to be talked about by him today. So let's welcome um, Professor Thank you, Jason, for that very kind and extensive introduction. So. <laughs> Uh, and thank you to all of you for sparing your Friday afternoon to come listen to me. Um, so I realized that in the announcement that went out, uh, the word storage got cut. So it looked like for providing virtual energy. In case <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what that is. So you, you feel wonder if you actually came to this talk, looks like ge gentlemen here came well, because of energy, and then you thought that I'm going to create virtual energy, and sorry to disappoint you, that's not going to be any virtual energy, and I'm going to talk about virtual energy storage, all right? <laughs> so, and of course, needless to say, all this work that I'm going to present actually was done by my students, and a lot of it was done in collaboration with my collaborators who are over there. Um, so, moving on, uh, my so, so talk is going to be about control systems. Um, but the application is for energy and sustainability, and in particular, renewable energy. So you know, this day and age, we kind of know what the issues are. Uh, renewable energy is great, but the problem is that it's intermittent and it's variable, right? So there is some data, uh, just to kind of paint the picture clearly. This data comes from a, what is called the Balancing Authority in the Pacific Northwest, Bonneville Power Administration. They're, they have about 30% of electricity. 30% of their energy comes from wind, so it's like a high renewable penetration area. All right, and that's their demand over four weeks in April, about five gigawatts, and this is the wind generation. Uh, two days in April, no wind, and then it picks up, it almost reaches a demand, and then dies again, and again reaches uh, almost the demand. So this is a problem for the coal generators and the nuclear and the hydro generators, because the problem is, Earlier, this is how the demand was, and they could predict the demand more or less pretty accurately, and they would uh, balance the demand with generation because all the generation was controllable. It was cold, nuclear, hydro, all this conventional stuff that you could call them up or send them some signals, and they will vary up and down so that the demand is always met. And it's always important to keep this balance between demand and supply in the power grid at all time scales. So of course, uh, if there is no power, I mean, that you'll have. Uh, you know, you won't have lights, but it's important to keep this balance, demand and supply balance down to the microsecond. Otherwise, generators will spin out of control, and then they shut down, they'll trip, and then there'll be blackouts, uh, terrible things will happen. So you have to keep all this demand and supply in balance. And earlier, uh, generation is controllable, so you control the generation to meet demand. Now, if 30% of your generation comes from stuff like this, which cannot be controlled and cannot be predicted very well, uh, then you have a problem because then the coal generators have to ramp up and down to track this signal. That's called net load. Okay, net load is demand minus generation. Demand minus the uncontrollable generation. So this is the part that controllable generation has to supply. This is called a net load. And you can see that sometimes you know, it goes from 6 gigawatts to about 1 gigawatt within a matter of hours. So multiple large thermal plants have to be shut down and then suddenly they have to be ramped up and this is a problem. Now, of course, if batteries were very expensive, uh, very cheap, not a problem. You can just store all this energy in batteries and uh, supply it when you need them. Problem is batteries are quite expensive still, so people are looking at other options. And one other option that everybody is interested in, and it's uh, generated a lot of excitement, is to try to control demand, right? Because we have lost control of part of generation. Uh, all you need to do is maintain this balance, though why not control demand? Of course, you have to do it in a way uh, well, there are lots of constraints, right? So how do you actually control demand? Uh, most of the stuff that you see in the literature and also has been implemented in demonstrations is uh, market-based. So the idea is that consumers like you and me will take part in this market just like big generators do today. And in, in a simulation, you work out. You can actually prove some nice theorems too. But in practice, I'm not sure if this is going to be scalable because then you're exposing consumers to really large amounts of risk. 
And the other idea that also has been kind of tried out both in theory and in practice to some on limited extent is direct load control. So your uh, whatever devices you have will be controllable remotely uh, from the utility. Now in the age of IoT, the technical difficulty is not there. You can always do that now. Uh, problem is what's going to happen to the consumers, right? So both these uh, things that have been tried out, uh, people are looking at, have got all these weaknesses. So the idea that we are pursuing at University of Florida, and I think more people are kind of uh, beginning to like this idea, is to not just do market-based or direct load control, but do it in such a way that you know, maintain strict bounds of the consumer's quality of service so you don't have to make consumers market players. You can sign long-term contracts saying that, you know, suppose you have an air conditioner, I'll say, let me install this software in your air conditioner. The software will guarantee that whatever it does to the AC, you don't have to know, but it'll guarantee that your house temperature will not go plus minus two degree Fahrenheit beyond whatever you like. And in return, I will pay you a monthly fee. And if you are willing to tolerate plus minus four degree, I'll pay you a higher monthly fee. So it's much more uh, easier to kind of sign contracts with stuff like that. So the consumer's quality of service is paramount. But of course, it has to be done with a decentralized manner because you are talking about coordinating millions and millions of loads. So we call it virtual energy storage. That's where the title comes from. So what is this virtual energy storage? Uh, it's pretty simple, actually. If you think of a real storage, this is a battery that supplies grid-level energy storage. Power consumption as a function of time, you know, it's sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Positive power consumption of the battery would mean that the battery is charging power, meaning it's consuming power from the grid. Negative power consumption of the battery means it's discharging back to the grid. Right? That's simple. If you look at a load, uh, let's say uh, air conditioning system in a commercial building or even in your residence, power consumption is always positive. Right? So what is this uh, virtual battery? The idea is I'm going to put some software, install some software on this air conditioning system so that it's going to intentionally put some variation on top of that demand. So this is how the demand is going to look like because of that software. You, know, you don't really need it just to maintain temperature. We're going to do it. Why? Because then if you look at this actual demand minus the baseline, minus what the thing would have done if left to itself, that deviation looks like charging and discharging of a battery. So the building is kind of you know, bringing power from the grid extra that it doesn't need and releasing back to the grid. And presumably, if it does in such a way that helps the grid, it's providing the same service to the grid as a battery. So we call it a virtual energy storage. Is that idea clear? Any, any questions? Let's resolve them now, because otherwise, the rest of the talk is not going to be very useful. <laughs> All right? So our goal is to do this with software with control algorithms. A couple of uh, issues. Uh, sure, uh, we can do that. Right? We can always vary power consumption by turning things on and off, by ramping up and down. But what will happen to the consumer's quality of service? Uh, how do you guarantee that you actually maintain bounds? And suppose I can do that too. Maybe I can vary extremely little bit, not much. And then the consumers would not feel any difference. But if I put some such tight constraints, maybe it does not help the grid. So how do you actually balance that? Uh, to answer the first question about maintaining consumer's quality of service, uh, that can be done. The way to think about it is in thinking like frequency domain. So of course, you can understand that if you vary the power consumption too much from what the baseline is, then you and I think of the HVAC system, air conditioning system. That's like the cleanest example. To ramp up the airflow in this room a lot and then decrease it to zero, of course, you feel, you feel some difference. But if you ramp up and down quickly, uh, maintain the amplitude, but also the frequency, then you and I would not feel any difference. So uh, take the airflow here. This is like this is let's say a baseline airflow, and the idea is to increase the airflow up by 10 percent and then down by 10 percent, but quickly enough. So the, the thermal inertia of the building basically low pass filters out this disturbance. So we and I would not feel any difference, but the power consumption would go up and down almost at the same rate that the airflow has gone up and down. Right? Oh, well, how about efficiency? Good, good efficiency. question. Um, I'm not going to talk about efficiency today, but we recently wrote a paper that shows that if you keep doing this indefinitely, uh, the efficiency goes to one. So there's a small loss in efficiency in the very beginning. 
but it actually decays to zero. So you don't actually cause any inefficiency. And if all the systems are linear, then there is zero inefficiency. But of course, the HVAC systems are non-linearity, so there is a little bit of loss in the beginning. But towards the end, it's not. In steady state, it's not. But you cannot do that. Uh, even if you keep the amplitude small, time scale has to be maintained, and that's kind of important, right? So even if you increase by 10%, but keep it high 10% for like two hours, and then you decrease by 10% for the next two hours, so really slow time scale variation, then there will be some noticeable perhaps change in temperature. So for air conditioning systems, you have to maintain not just the amplitude of variation, but also keep the frequency of variation high enough. Right? For other systems, it will be something else. So a air conditioning system, you can say we can make it into a virtual battery uh, with a charge discharge cycle of maybe up to an hour or so, right? but not longer. So depending on the class of loads, you can come up with a diagram like this to show the constraint. This is in frequency domain. X axis is frequency, Y axis is uh, the power spectral density of the demand variation. So if you vary the demand very slow, like that, then bad things will happen. For HVAC, temperature will go up and down too much. For other loads, something else might happen. It'll, this picture will vary from load to load. Right? For HVAC, too slow will lead to unacceptable fluctuation. Too fast, if you vary it extremely fast, you and I would not feel any difference at all, but maybe the equipment uh, life cycle, lifetime will degrade. So that's also bad. That's also another measure of quality of service. So right in the middle, there is a region uh, marked by this curve, the amplitude versus frequency, where as long as your power spectral density lies in, lies in this range, you're fine. Right? Y-axis is the, the power spectral density of the demand variation of the red curve. Is, uh, is this a storage signal, the power spectral density of this. So it has to be fast enough and small enough, but not too fast. So it cannot be too fast, cannot be too slow, cannot be too large, uh, depending on the load class. So basically the constraint has to be expressed in this form. And then once you figure this out for every class of loads, then you can say, all right, this, remember, this is the signal that all these controllable resources have to provide. So now the controllable resources are what? We have coal plants, nuclear power plants, all that stuff. Already we have it. Plus we have the smart loads, right? So we have air conditioners, but also we have residential water heaters. We can also do similar, play similar games with those commercial water heaters. Pool pumps, in Florida pool pumps are six gigawatts of peak demand. So actually quite, quite a bit, right? Uh, California, irrigation is like 20 gigawatts of peak demand, it's huge, right? HPC maybe another one, I don't know, yeah, data centers definitely, I don't know what can be done with data centers, you guys would know better, maybe not a whole lot, because constraints would be really tight. So we have all these controllable resources, and we have to somehow divide up this job among all of those, and the way to do this, because I'm already expressing the constraints in frequency domain, is to basically employ a whole bunch of bandpass filters, and say, all right, uh, this signal, I'm going to first band pass filter it, or actually low pass filter it, so this is how the signal looks like. And that will go, this is like the really low time scale, and that will go to coal plants and nuclear power plants and things like that, right? So they don't need to now shut down quickly, then they have to ramp down quickly, uh, slowly, so they can do that. The remaining signals, then you can keep band pass filtering it. Uh, so this blue one is kind of a time scale of a day. Then there's a gray one which we cannot see much. It's a time scale of hours. Uh, and then the last one is the very high frequency content in this original signal. That's in a time scale of minutes. So different load classes, as long as you can find enough loads that can service in this range of frequencies, then you can actually cover all of that. Uh, and the lowest one, that is going to require some energy because you know this is power versus time. The area under the curve is not zero. That's energy that has to be provided by generators. Loads cannot produce energy, right? So therefore, all of these signals are the storage signals because the area under them is zero, uh, zero mean. So that this is the same picture again, uh, but it's showing the resource adequacy. You need a picture like this to work out uh, because. This is the power spectral density of the net demand, this red line. 
And these are the capacity curves of all these resources. This is the capacity curve of the conventional generators. Maybe industrial loads can provide this slow time scale. We don't know yet. Pool pumps, water heaters, they can provide in hours. Commercial HVAC in the scale of minutes. Batteries, you can actually use batteries too in this framework. They can provide really a high fast time scale because this is the business model for all the battery companies now. They want to play in the frequency regulation market because they, batteries cannot store a really lot of energy, the, the current technology. But they are really good at ramping up and down quickly. So they want to do this. So, yeah, good question. Uh, the slower the time scale, I guess, more prediction you need. Like this stuff, this will be pure feedback at this time scale. Right, yeah. But here, you need some prediction. Right. So there's some, I try to sweep something under the rug. You see, I claim that's a low pass filter. People have taken digital signal processing classes, right? What's the problem with that low pass filter signal? <laughs> Problem is that there's no phase lag. Uh, if you take a signal processing class, you'll see that there's something funky going on. There's no phase lag in the filter signal. Okay, this is not causal filtering. So what's happening? I'm using prediction of the renewable generation to actually get that curve, right? So there is some prediction uh, uh, being used already there. All right. So that was that was the introduction. All right. So we need to use these loads. Uh, we know what kind of jobs these loads can do based on their frequency characteristic. Uh, the problem is to not coordinate them because each load can do only so much. Now, the problem becomes different, actually. The, the challenges are quite distinct depending on the class of loads you're talking about. So for this talk, I've divided them into two classes. One is continuously variable loads. The other is on-off loads. So on-off loads are more uh, are the ones that we see more often. Your air conditioning system at home, it only turns on or off. That's about it, right? You cannot find uh, power consumption chain. But the air conditioning system for this building is a variable air volume system, so you can vary its power consumption from zero to the maximum at like any location you want. Right, so those are, con those are continuously variable loads. And by the way, we can actually, uh, so, so the, I'm, I'm going to divide this talk now. The remaining is going to be divided into two parts. And these two parts are more or less independent. So if you feel like taking a nap during part one, do that and wake up for part two and it's a whole lot, right? Don't. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so topic one, coordinating a large number of continuously variable loads. Uh, first of all, let me do some shameless um, advertisement. Uh, actually, what can you do with one load? Uh, it turns out, People who have been writing reports on this, PNNL has a bunch of reports on different loads, ability to do certain things, but nobody had actually proven that yes, they can in fact be used to do this until in 2015 we did an experiment in a building in University of Florida campus. So this is a complete closed loop system that we showed that this guy, the fan, uh, the variable frequency drive of the fan motor can be controlled in real time to track a signal coming from the grid. So actually this can be done and it tracks beautifully. So we showed that this can actually take part in the market if the building were located in PJM territory, which is in Northeast. Florida does not have uh, electricity markets, uh, not the kind of markets, with the deregulated markets that we have in the Northeast. So we cannot do this now. It looks like you do have a big market. Yeah. Uh, well, the problem is that there are a lot of measurement noise, so it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, so there is definitely some error, but PJM gives us uh, performance metrics that we must hit. 0.75 was the score that we had to get. We got 0.83, so we, can, we, we meet the requirements. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of how we did that. Uh, it took us quite a bit of time, but to show that this can be done. And after we did that, now there are a couple of groups that have shown similar things. There's a group at ETH, one group at Berkeley. Those two groups have definitely done experiments to show that yes, they can do it in their building too. Right. So this was done in about a, like a minute's time scale. This was 40 minutes duration. Um, and then we showed, but we did not actually show through experiments. By that, uh, by that time, money ran out, so we only could <laughs> do simulations. We showed that, yeah, we can actually increase the time scale with HVAC systems to about uh, one hour or so. But then we'll lose about two degrees Celsius of variation. Um, 
So as long as people are comfortable with plus minus two degrees Celsius variation, uh, uh, we can do quite a bit of these things with a single building. But even a single building can only do so much, right? You can see you've got the, we're getting one kilowatt peak to peak variation. And the grid wants megawatts and megawatts of these things. So how are you going to use many, many, many buildings? So that's the question, right? That's what the, the topic of the talk is actually. So, all right. So you can say, well, let's do something really simple. Uh, we know that each building will have a band pass filter. I guess I should emphasize this. Because the signal coming from the grid will be in megawatts, and each building can only provide kilowatts. Plus, uh, remember that the constraints for a building or any load will be, you know, the signal, this signal that goes into the building has to be constrained in frequency uh, between some high and low frequency. So there has to be a band pass filter here. Excuse me. So yeah, we can put a whole bunch of band pass filters. The idea is that this reference signal in megawatts get broadcast to all the loads. And then in these bandpass filters, which are located on site, we will divide this into uh, different six, uh, reference signals. And the building one is going to track that R1, building two is going to track R2. These are in kilowatts. Uh, but you divide it in such a way that all these kilowatts add up to the megawatts. And if each building does its job, then at the output, you get same as R. And that's the goal of any control system, typically. And your output should be equal to the reference. But for that to work out, these uh, frequency response of all these filters might, must add up to one at all frequencies. Only then you get some of these signals equal to that signal. And uh, well, okay. I assume that most of the students have not taken control systems courses. If you, if you did, you would realize that this is never going to work because it's completely open loop. So any uncertainty in these uh, things, you're building at high noon in South Florida is saying, I'm using all that that I need, uh, I cannot really do any of this stuff. Uh, so there's a 10% error coming from this building. This guy will have exactly 10% error. So there is no robustness to uncertainty. And uh, the only general principle we have for fighting uncertainty is feedback. So we're going to use feedback. And the idea to use feedback here is pretty straightforward, is to use the grid frequency. So you plug, you can, you know, the, the moment you use power from one of these outlets, current and the voltage are both supposed to be around 60 hertz. They're never exactly at 60 hertz. Uh, they're exactly at 60 hertz only when the demand and the general supply are exactly equal. But they're never exactly equal. If there's too much generation, basically that means that some generator is spinning faster, so the frequency is uh, higher. There's too much demand, then the frequency is a bit lower. So by measuring the frequency from your power outlet, you can have an idea of how much global demand supply imbalance there is. Uh, that's a very useful uh, signal because you can get a global estimate from a local signal. So the idea is to use that measurement. And people have done things like this. There's an experiment that was reported in 2011. They built this little box to measure the frequency, and they implemented some demand response type idea uh, in this island off the coast of Sweden. Uh, the idea was that when there is uh, too much demand, some of the loads need to shut down or reduce their demand dramatically. And they would do that just by using the frequency measurement. So these things can be done now pretty easily. All right, so now we get into a little bit of a, the nitty gritty details of exactly how to do this. So one thing is we're gonna use feedback, but we are going to still use some information from the grid operator. So the information the loads are going to use is that, that the grid operator is going to broadcast to every load a prediction of the grid level demand supply imbalance. So there's a question about prediction. Uh, we are trying to do this in a scale of, let's say, an hour or so. So the grid operator is going to predict what kind of demand supply imbalance it expects to see for the next one hour. And five minutes later, it's going to update it, send it again. And that's all it's going to just keep broadcasting these uh, predictions. And each load solves an optimization problem. Uh, this is, uh, I apologize for all the super subscripts here, but actually it's not that complicated. All it is doing is they're saying every load, so the I superscript stands for the ith load, so you can ignore that, just we add one load. And it's predicting the frequency of the grid and say I want to minimize the frequency of the grid. So this is actually not the frequency, it's frequency deviation from 60 hertz. So your, every load tries to minimize the deviation of the frequency from 60 hertz. Because if the deviation is zero, that means everything is perfect. Demand supply completely imbalanced. Right? But how does it know that? 
well, it tries to predict itself how that is going to be based on what it knows about the grid. Well, it knows two things. It knows what kind of control action it's doing inside itself, and that particular control action at load I is the variation in demand is going to implement. That is, that's its control. It's doing its baseline thing, but to help the grid, it'll do either a little bit up, a little bit down, and that up and down bit, that's the control, right? But also, the grid is telling you, uh, telling the load, how much imbalance it expects to see anyways, so it uses that broadcast, okay, plus whatever it has got, and it knows that this is the total imbalance kind of affecting the grid, so therefore it should determine what the frequency is. So it's using a very simple model, right? I think it's worthwhile to go into the models by using some simple model to say, okay, that will depend on my control action and this disturbance, and my control action has to lie between up and down because I can only vary, uh, you know, maybe one kilowatt up, one kilowatt down. And plus, whatever variation I do from now till one hour, uh, that variation, the Fourier transform of that variation has to lie inside this region because that was how the constraint was imposed. Remember this picture I showed you earlier that you can do anything you want as long as the frequency and amplitude lies inside that range. So if you think of the DFT of you know, the signal, the discrete Fourier transform, the magnitude has to be bounded by this curve. And this curve is unique to every load. So nobody else knows this, only that load knows it, as determined by some sort of experiment. So you can actually show, well, I forgot to put a square, if I put a square, it's a complex problem, you can actually have the exact solution, unique solution, you can solve it, uh, pretty straightforward. So there are a few other wrinkles to it, but I think it's, uh, we don't need to go into that. And you can actually show some interesting properties about this algorithm in some, under some very strong assumptions. Okay, we have to make some very strong assumptions. You can show uh, that if the disturbance affecting the grid is constant uh, and the assumptions hold, then the frequency deviation will in fact go to zero, meaning the load switch end up doing exactly the right thing. And it's in our paper that uh, got presented in American Control Conference. Uh, if you are really interested in this stuff, then you can uh, look it up. But I'm gonna just show you some simulations to, to show how the thing works in practice. So the grids, uh, the loads use a very simple model saying that if one kilowatt variation in my demand is going to produce, you know, one microhertz deviation in the, uh, in the grid frequency, which is this, but actually simulation down it have a more complicated uh, linear system, right? And the disturbance to the grid is a very simple one too. Uh, it's just sum of two sinusoids. One is at one hour, the other is at half hour. So what the loads are supposed to do is if the loads don't do anything, which if they keep doing their baseline thing, uh, then the grid frequency is going to vary like this, and that's bad, there's a cost to it. Ideally what the loads should do together somehow they should implement uh, some variation in their demand so that total variation becomes exactly the negative of the disturbance and then everything gets canceled out. That's what they should do. And in fact, they nearly do that. So that's the disturbance coming at the grid. This is a total consumption change, the blue line, total meaning sum of all the loads. And I think there are like how many loads? There are quite a few loads, I think 10,000 loads, right? So there's some initial transient in the grid frequency, but then it settles down to a much smaller value. It doesn't look like a whole lot better than the previous one uh, because of these uh, oscillations which happen because the control is updated every five minutes. So every five minutes is a little bit of a kick. Right? But we can improve that. We have actually improved that in, in more recent work. And this is what you see. Uh, this is what the, the DFT of the actual control signal. This is the constraint that was imposed to satisfy the constraint. Uh, when you make the constraint tighter, you say, no, I do not want any load to vary their consumption at the time scale of one hour. So that's like a HVAC load. You say, one hour is too bad. It's, uh, it's bad in enough that I'm going to see variations in indoor climate. So I'm only going to let you vary in a half an hour time scale, but not one hour. So of course the loads then cannot do much, but they do whatever they can. You still reduce uh, the cost by 40%, but as you can see here, uh, they, because they're forced to be low in this frequency, they cannot really reject all the disturbance. So they do end up doing what uh, they're allowed to do based on the constraints. So 
that's kind of what we did for this continuously variable loads. Um, pros, there, is, uh, there are lots of positive things about this algorithm. There are some cons too. One is that it's, robust, it's robust to uncertain about how other loads are doing, even to malicious failure. So uh, there is no communication among the loads. It's a distributed control, but there is no consensus. There is no information exchange, nothing. There is a broadcast from the balancing authority that every load is receiving, and every load is also measuring the grid frequency locally. So, so for the broadcast, uh, does it rely on some additional communication infrastructure? Or yes, there has to be uh, something so that they can receive that broadcast. So that could be power line communication. It could be cellular. I don't know what so that would be. Right now, uh, commercial nodes can do that easily because they are all connected to because they all have SCADA systems. Residential loads, no. So that has to be, so if you want to retrofit existing residential loads to be able to do this, it will be super expensive. It's not possible. But it's pretty cheap to retrofit uh, loads with that sort of ability at the factory. But it has to be done through a change in regulation. They have to say all loads need to be you know, smart grid friendly. So they need to be able to connect to 3G network for this kind of a protocol, things like that. Then you can uh, do this. Or power line communication, I don't know. So yeah, that's uh, something for communication and computer science people to figure out what can be done, what cannot be done. Uh, I'm assuming that some amount of, some, so every five minutes, one packet of broadcast uh, communication can be received. So it's uh, robust and malicious failure. So imagine some of the loads have been hacked. <laughs> You know, they are doing weird things. It doesn't matter as long as enough of the remaining loads are still doing their thing because all they are doing is they are looking at the broadcast of what might happen in the grid, what is expected to happen. And they are also trying to estimate the same thing, what is happening right now based on the frequency measurement. So even if some loads are hurting, remaining loads, as long as the fraction of, of loads that have not been hacked is sufficiently large, they can actually balance the grid. So there is some amount of robustness to hacking too. Uh, of course, it's one way low bandwidth communication. Privacy preserving because there is no communication among the loads. Uh, and this may not be important to you guys, but whenever we talk about this sort of stuff in a controls conference, distributed control in a controls community means consensus. Everybody right. has to talk to everybody else and figure something out. And uh, so this is kind of an attack on that. <laughs> we don't need internal communication. Uh, cons. Uh, right now, the architecture has been used is slightly different from what the grid uses because right now the grid is set up to transmit reference signals to these loads or to any resources, but not to broadcast demand supply imbalance. But we're saying that no, we don't need your reference signal, just send us the demand supply imbalance prediction. They do have this demand supply imbalance prediction because balancing authorities actually spend a lot of time and money trying to come up with predictions for renewable generation and demand forecast. So they actually have it so they can broadcast it. But it's right now the infrastructure is not there to start sending this stuff. So that was that, yes. How do cost customers getting benefit out of this? Like how do you quantify that? Right. Very good question. The customers are not getting any benefit except for a monthly payment. But the customers are not also getting any loss because we are maintaining this constraint that whatever demand variation you are doing, uh, the demand variation there in the power spectrum that we are free across from lies in this range, which guarantees that whatever loss of quality of service the customer will suffer is within the range that was agreed upon in the contract. So we try, the way to do this would be do an experiment in a building, let's say. Figure out, okay, if you do this kind of variation, how much does the temperature vary? So if you do this much, you get one degree Celsius variation. If you do this much, you get two degrees Celsius variation. Then you ask the customer, do you agree to one degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius? Maybe for one degree Celsius, you get $100 a month. For two degree, you get $200 a month. The customer says, I only can tolerate one degree. I'll be okay with $100 a month. Then you say, okay, that's the contract. And then you use the curve corresponding to the one degree Celsius. Right? If the customer says, I'm fine at two degree, then this curve would be wider. You would get better capacity. But this, this, so this constraint in the frequency domain or whatever domain it's, it's just a mathematical tool I'm using but somehow you have to we are ensuring that the quality of service is guaranteed to remain within bounds so we don't have to actually model consumer behavior 
Any other questions? Okay. All right, so let's leave this behind and let's go to part two. <laughs> Coordinating a large number of on-off loads. So on-off loads, so um, now these are consumer devices. This kind of air conditioners. You can only turn on or off. So here the challenge is different. This might be a closer to computer science uh, kind of thing that computer science people uh, worry about, right? Because now it becomes a combinatorial optimization problem. You got a bunch of zeros and ones, right? So what's the complexity here? Well, suppose you have a million air conditioners. Each can be only turned one or zero or off, uh, one or zero, turn on or off. So at any given time, for one load, you have two decisions, possible decisions. If you have two loads, you have two to D2. If you have N loads, two to the N. So million loads, at any given time, you have a possible two to the million choices. But that's only if you are very myopic. Uh, you, you cannot just make decisions at one time, and next time you can forget about whatever happened in the past and make decisions just there. Because what you did earlier, because buildings are thermal inertia, so what you did earlier is going to affect what's happening now. So you actually have to look at the history. So uh, the competition space over which you have to optimize, it's like 2 to the million, 2 to the power, I don't know, 15, 16, depending on how long a time series you are looking at. So it's an impossible problem. A lot of people have been working on this, and a lot of the work that has gone into this problem, there's a huge literature on this, okay? I have not really cited any specific people because there's so many, uh, but I have kind of uh, listed two of the main uh, themes. And the first theme is, you try to model this as a Markov chain by saying, yeah, it's a deterministic system, but there are so many of them affected by so many different unknown factors that ultimately you can model it probabilistically. And you can say, okay, you divide the temperature into bins and say, how many ACs are likely to be in this bin at a given time? How many ACs are likely to be in this bin at a given time? And then how many of them are likely to transition from a colder to a slightly warmer? And then you start playing games with that figure out the Markov transition probability matrix, and then it's say, okay, how can I manipulate that, and things like that. The other one is based on queuing theory. You know, people, you know, people always they see a nail and they want to hit the nail with the hammer they have got. So people who have been doing queuing theory, they want to apply queuing theory to this, and it's a, my opinion is it's not gonna work. I mean, it's, it's an impossible thing. Uh, they want to know, you know, a list of devices and the priority. Consumers to say, my computer is more important than my toaster oven, which is more important than my this and that. And then using that list, you're gonna figure this out. It's, not a, it's gonna done, be done on millions and millions of devices. I don't see how that can be done. But anyways, so our proposal is kind of close to the first option, except instead of saying, okay, let's see what the ACs are doing now and try to model them as a Markov chain. Let's say, you know what? We're going to rip up the, the controller, that board that's in the AC, and we're going to replace it by another board, which is going to make the control action itself random. So we'll toss a coin and decide to turn it on or off, depending on the coin toss. It sounds like a crazy idea, but it works beautifully, all right? This kind of thing that you use in communication, you know, the request to send, clear to send, and then you wait a random amount of time, things like that. So before, without this stuff gets real technical really uh, quickly, but I think the main ideas are simple. I'm trying to try to explain you the main ideas without diving too deep into the math. So this is how a deterministic control would look like. This is what the thermostat in your home air conditioner does. Outside temperature is 30 degrees Celsius constant. This is the simulation, okay? And you are supposed to remain always between 24.5 and 21. Uh, so what happens is outside is hot, so temperature goes up, and right when it hits that upper boundary, the thermostat says, okay, turn on. So it goes to one mode, and it remains in one mode, so the temperature starts decreasing. It goes above a little bit because of thermal inertia. You know, you cannot suddenly drop the temperature even when you turn the AC on. So then it starts going down, and then again it crosses the low threshold, then it goes to zero. Because of thermal inertia, temperature keeps dropping a little bit farther, but then it comes up because outside is warm, and you turn the AC off. And this is what it does, cyclic. This is what thermostat control is, deterministic algorithm. We are going to replace it by a randomized control. So what is this randomized control? When it hits the upper and lower boundary, it's the same as the thermostat. But in between, with a small probability, it will do something weird. All right, it will say in between, turn on or off with a probability that depends on two things. One is it depends on currents and previous temperature. So for example, if you're like right at that boundary, you don't want to mess with it too much. But if you're in the middle, then you have more leeway. 
So it depend, there's a probability that will depend on the current and previous temperature. And also, it will depend on a broadcast signal from the grid. So that broadcast signal is going to be our main control variable. So the grid says, I want more consumption. This probability will be pushed in one direction because of that broadcast signal. So they will more of the probability of turning on will be higher, and vice versa. I will get to that in a moment. So if you look at, so this simulation is done without any interference from the grid, right? So you just replace the deterministic control by this randomized control. And you see that consumer's quality of service is maintained because the moment it goes slightly above, it comes back. Moment the temperature goes slightly below the low value, it comes up. In between, sometimes it does weird things that deterministic control would not do, like here and there. But unless somebody is looking at this data from his uh, home thermostat, nobody is going to even see that this is what is going on. So consumers are not going to feel any difference, right? So that is that. Now, how do we actually do this thing? Oh, this is when it's kind of technical. Uh, first of all, define a state space. So every load, one load, many loads, no, actually not a big difference, but let's look at one load. Uh, there is a state associated with each load, and the state is a, is a pair. The first entry of the state is called XM, and that's a mode. It's 0 or 1, off or on. The second entry is the temperature, so it belongs to the set of wheels. And then you can do uh, some stuff to show that this actually evolves like a Markov chain. Uh, this is the PDF of the Markov chain. So if you bin your temperature, then this becomes a Markov chain. If you don't bin your temperature, the temperatures are real, then this becomes a Markov operator because it's an infinite matrix. But all the intuition that you want to develop comes from, you can develop by using uh, finite state spaces. So no need to get technical here, I guess. You can think of this just a simple Markov chain. Now this Markov transition probabilistic matrix can be modeled as this. It's a product of two transition matrices. Okay, the first one is the control. The second one is the effect of disturbance. The outset temperature temperature is the disturbance. Right? So it determines when the how the temperature transitions. The control determines how the mode transitions. Then one okay, two more definitions to go after that. I think this will be over. The import, this is the important quantity. Y of t is the probability that the mode is 1. So the probability that the, the AC is on, right? That's, that's Y of t. Now suppose you have n loads, million, 10 million, 2,000, doesn't matter, and all of them are applying the same decision logic. Then you can define an empirical uh, probability, which is basically the fraction of loads that are on. So the idea is that assuming you know all your Markov chain is well behaved and all that, you have some version of the law of large number holes, and what you get is that this fraction of loads that are on converges to the true probability. And why is this useful? Because what happens is that by designing this Markov chain that you are going to put in a chip in one load, you can now predict what the average behavior of all these millions of loads are going to be. So the design problem has been kind of moved from this you know, million dimension combinatorial space into designing these transition probability matrices for one load. And that's kind of, that's the key idea. Right. So once you have that and say, well, I just need to predict the probability of being on of any load, and I know that uh, based on these uh, matrices, so I know what fraction of loads would be on at any given time. So if I had to control that, you know, all I need to think about is how to control one load, and that will help me control the aggregate by design. So that's the only uh, kind of real conceptual difference. And by the way, what you really want to control is this normal, the deviation. So y t minus y zero. Y zero is uh, the fraction of loads that are on under baseline conditions when the outside temperature is kind of constant. Uh, so then there are some more technical stuff that you have to go through to come up with linear approximation so you can do control design. And the control design would look like this. Every load is going to just do that randomized control. It like, takes a few lines of code and a random number generator. That's all it takes. Uh, and they're being affected by some different disturbances. The control design here gets a little bit complicated. What it has to do is to compute that number zeta. Uh, because that zeta is going to affect uh, this transition to on or off. And this is done based on this linear approximation. So 
given that we are kind of coming to the end of the one hour, I have already taken too much of your attention. So I'm going to skip that part uh, and show you the results. So this is what you get. The balancing authority designs that number zeta as a signal. It changes with time. Based on a prediction of the disturbance, because the disturbance outside climate is what's going to determine uh, what fraction of time a load is on or off. Uh, so this is a disturbance for the Suppose you have a, a large area in South Florida that is under this kind of control, uh, then the balancing authority will have to take some sort of mean temperature prediction. It uses that prediction to design that controller, but actually the loads are being affected by all sorts of other disturbances. So I'm showing here the black line, which is the prediction of the outside temperature used by the balancing authority to compute that signal zeta, and 10 and the actual temperature experienced by 10 of the loads. So they're actually being uh, subjected to other And this is what you get. This is the tracking. Uh, I'm not showing in megawatts. I'm only showing in uh, normalized, like, fraction of loads that are on. You can scale it by the power capacity of each load, and you'll get a megawatt number. So the black line is what the grid wants you to track. Uh, and we have 5,000 air conditioners each, like about 3 kilowatt, I think. Um, and, the, and the, this is how the system behaves. So the Y tilde, which is what the simulation tells us, is uh, how the tracking behaves. So it actually is pretty good. Um, I remember the underlying problem is you have to solve 10 to the 5, 2 to the 5,000 to the power, I think it's 2 hours, so 2 to the power 24 because a 2 hour horizon. Right? So 2 to the 5,000 to the power 24, and we replaced all that by a, a linear system optimization problem, which I did not go through. But it's a two by two system that is uh, solved for about uh, 24 So it actually does pretty well. And uh, the last question would be, OK, what's happening to the consumer? right? Because now it's asking to sometimes turn on, sometimes turn off, more than what it does usually. And again, you can see, yes, sometimes it turns on or off, depending on what the grid is asking. So the blue, the black line is the baseline, which is what the grid is not interfering. And the red dots are under this VES operation. And yes, yeah, there are, of course, differences. But again, it's always between the high and the low limit with some random switching in between. So the consumer's quality of service is also, pre also preserved. So again, similar pros and cons, uh, privacy preserving, one-way low bandwidth, benign to me, uh, robust to benign and malicious failures because uh, you just broadcast this signal zeta to all the loads. Loads are implementing a local control. They're not even doing frequency measurement. Right? Actually, they will have to because one of the problems with this is that we're assuming we can use that feedback signal. So we can actually measure what fraction of loads are on, which is a very difficult thing to measure. But I think we'll have to replace that by, by frequency measurement. So yeah, needs estimate of fraction of loads on. Uh, another weakness is that the consumer quality of service guarantees are probabilistic because the whole framework is probabilistic, which means that with low probability, and I think we're tail of a Gaussian, few guys will see very large deviations uh, from their temperature. Very small, but it will happen uh, with low probability. So, so we're still studying those effects. Yeah, the simul simulations we are assuming homogeneous. I mean, yes and no. We, uh, simulation is for homogeneous loads, so they have the same power, all of that. Uh, but they are being subjected to different disturbances. So what is the uh, you know, looking at the code, you know, I, I could assume that we can go with the load, but... Uh, air conditioner, one air conditioner. Right. Yeah. The air conditioner, for example, the temperature, you know, response to the... Yeah, on that's on true. Different. Yes, yes, the clearly, yes, yeah. So yeah, that's a. This are kind of. This is not published work yet. This part, okay. This is like hot off the press. Uh, I, we need to run those simulations. I'm pretty confident uh, heterogeneity. As long as there's no difference in the mean, will not be a problem, because the whole thing is anyway averaging out. But these simulations are with homogeneous loads, yes. And you are right. In practice, not every air conditioner has the same power, has the same thermal response. They are all different. But as long as you get the mean right, I think this will be fine. And actually, that's the end of my talk. Uh, why are we doing all this? Because this is going to be a low-cost alternative to batteries. The goal is to drive the battery companies out of business. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's only change in software. All right. No change in hardware. Uh, but cost testing, how much exactly is going to cost is still a very tricky question. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in some of the details, uh, there are some papers in my website. All right. Thank you for your attention. Pursuing some commercialization uh, avenues. The problem is it's it's a matter of uh, language, right? The moment you say probability, everybody runs out of the door. <laughs> right? So you have to invent another word to say the same thing. Uh, I guess you also need to collaborate with uh, like NPL. Yeah. So I guess the, the, the problem is Florida is one of the worst places to do this research. It's just kind of sad. Right, because there's so much solar potential, but there is no. We are proposing a solution to a problem that does not exist here, right? If it is, so we are getting much more uh, interest from companies from California and Texas than companies in Florida, because we go to the utilities in Florida, they say, yeah, no, we don't have that problem. We see a little bit of solar, ah, our generators can handle that, no problem. <laughs> now, which is true, right? Which is true because there's hardly any renewable uh, here in Florida, so they don't really care. So this is this has been a problem, but it's it's, it's changing. DOE is beginning to listen to us, so they think uh, this is going to work. Actually, this is if, if this will probably get in the randomized stuff. Will if it happens, it will probably get implemented in in by EDF in Paris before it happens in the U.S. Because our collaborator Anna Bush, uh, she is constantly in talks with EDF uh, in Paris. They they get this much more better than our uh, U.S. counterparts. So. Google, uh, Google is interested. Sean Mine uh, uh, on our collaborator, so he has been working with Google. But Google is actually interested in getting a patent on this, whereas we already have a patent on this. So this is that's all a bit of a problem. <laughs> why, why is Google actually? Google has an, an energy group. Oh, okay. They actually are yeah. doing something about uh, putting some money into energy.